give this time. Come face to face with just how shakable the foundation of this world is. We are reminded that the kingdom of God is the constant in the midst of the chaos. Lord, help us to find our hope in you and to recognize the sense in which what we believe has direct impact on the way that we live, what we do, and how we represent you regardless of our circumstances. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you bless our time this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like Pastor Anthony said, we have to get creative. I mean, for the time being, we have an extraordinary opportunity to continue to meet, but realistically, that could change at any day as different announcements from the CDC come out. I am encouraged in the midst of the craziness of this world because God's word helps us to understand that the witness of the Christian community is not dependent on their circumstances. We say often, right, that our theology, what we believe, impacts what we do. But perhaps it's times like this where it becomes such an acute reality that we can't escape the implications of this. I mean, the things that we thought to be standard and stalwart parts of American society seem to be crumbling before us. Costco, the shining beacon of American life, is now inaccessible. And we're thinking, did the rapture happen and we're still here? What is going on? Right? I'm being silly, but when it comes down to it, we recognize, right, that things that we thought to be constant are not constant indeed. In fact, these things are just as transient and temporary as anything else in this world, including things perhaps that we still have that we might have to think creatively should they be removed from the picture. There could be a day, maybe it's next week, maybe it's in the next month, who knows, when we can no longer meet in this building. That's already the case for many churches. As I speak right now, I'm in a really weird circumstance, first time in my preaching life, because as I preach to you, I am also preaching at a church in Buena Park via their live feed. As a larger church, they cannot meet. So we recorded everything last night, and now we've got everything online. That might be our future. I don't think that this should come as a discouragement to us. Because when it comes down to it, our worship is not dependent on our circumstances. It's dependent on two things. Recognizing who God is. And importantly, recognizing who we are according to who God is. I want to look at two particular texts today. Grab your Bibles, open to the New Testament. And we're going to start in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul has already described a whole variety of theological concepts. In chapter 1, he has helped the Ephesian church to recognize that they have been purchased by the blood of God, by his design, according to his purpose, and that God is the active agent in salvation. In chapter 2, he continues on with this idea with the extraordinarily important declaration, for you are saved by grace through faith and not by works. And then when he moves a little further through chapter 2, he addresses the idea of Christian unity, declaring to a diverse people that in spite of their cultural backgrounds, in spite of their historical backgrounds, They are bought and paid for by the same blood of Jesus. Therefore, whoever your great-granddaddy was doesn't matter. You are brought together into the family of God. And when he concludes this idea at the end of chapter 2, he introduces a really important concept that describes who the people of God are. In Ephesians 2, verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
in him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Who are the people of God? They are the place where God dwells. This is not a new idea. In the Old Testament, the prophets say God is sending his Messiah and his name will be Emmanuel, a Hebrew compound phrase that means not necessarily God with us, but more correctly, God in us. And this New Testament idea fleshes this out and describes the sense in which the people of God are the place where God's glory not only dwells, but demonstrates itself to this world. So what is the practical reality of this lofty theological ideal? That means that this building has nothing to do with God's presence unless we're here. Because it is the people who are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not only has this building never been the house of the Lord, it will never be the house of the Lord. Because if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you are the house of the Lord. God reveals himself to his people and to the world in a variety of different ways. In the book of Exodus, he leads his people out of Egypt and he shows himself to the surrounding nations as a pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. Over the course of other Old Testament stories and then even the New Testament stories, God reveals himself in a variety of different ways, whether a dove descending from heaven or what have you. But pound for pound, page by page, the single most and frequent way that God makes himself known to the world is through his people. Through a people that are called out to live specially, extraordinarily. A people who worship God no matter what their circumstances are. Whether in our case they're quarantined by coronavirus, whether in the New Testament case they are chained to a wall in a Roman prison, or whether in the Old Testament case they're wandering through the desert, not quite sure where they're going to end up. Our worship is not dependent on our circumstances because we have a God that transcends all of it. And we are being built together into the dwelling place for God which means that wherever you go, you take God with you. And wouldn't it be absolutely terrible if this building was God's house? Because that would mean that if next week we're not allowed to be here, we can't be with God. Praise God that is not true. And even if next week you're sitting on your couch watching a pre-recorded sermon online because we're trying to grapple with technology, there in your slippers with your dirty coffee cup that you don't wash because it's in your own house, you are experiencing the people of God communal even though we be scattered. And that is particularly important because though this text in Ephesians gives us this incredible picture of the community of the people of God, regardless of background, being built together into a place for God's glory not only to dwell but to be displayed, we need to look one other place that makes the case even more clearly. Flip back a couple pages and find 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. Now, for members of 11th Street, I'm going to sound like a broken record. You're getting so sick of this illustration. But I really do think that in the moment, this is particularly relevant for what we are discussing. In 1 Corinthians 6, we've got a passage that is couched in the middle of a whole bunch of rebukes to a Corinthian church that's not really living up to the standard of the gospel. I mean, just to list a couple of the things that Paul addresses in this book. It's only going to be a couple of verses later that Paul is going to have to rebuke this church for people sneaking in early and eating all the communion bread, drinking all the communion wine, and not leaving any for anybody else. Does that not kind of sound like what we're dealing with today? <laughs> right? And he says, guys, knock it off because you are called to community. In chapter 6, he's dealing with holiness, but I think that this idea transcends this particular chapter and is talking to all of these different situations. 
The way that you worship, how you worship, how you relate to each other, how you share what you have, how you express the holiness of God. Look in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This verse is used at least in popular speech, for a variety of different reasons. I've heard people say, your body is a temple, so don't get tattoos. I've heard other people say, your body is a temple, so eat right and exercise. Folks, I don't think either of those have anything to do with what Paul is expressing here. To get to the root of this, we got to take one step deeper, because our English obscures perhaps what's really coming through in this text. In proper, formal English, there's no way to represent a second-person plural. Here's what I mean. If I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. But if I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. And which you am I talking to? It's all the, what do you, yeah. Talking to you, right? Or you, or you. I mean, who knows who I'm talking to, right? It's determinant upon context. Other languages have solved this problem. If we were speaking Spanish right now, there would be no misinterpretation here because there is a grammatically correct way to represent the second person singular and the second person plural. English, for whatever reason, never developed that. Unless you're from Texas. Because then you've solved the problem. Because either I'm talking to you or I'm talking to y'all, right? I wish that, you know, grammarians and dictionaries and stuff would actually make that a standard thing because it's far more accurate, right? Why is all of this rel- relevant for us? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, the yous are y'alls in the Greek. And that's super important because that adds a layer of significance that's helping us to understand something about the people of God. Let's go ahead and read this with a fresh translation this morning. This is the 11th Street International Version, okay? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do y'all not know that y'all's body... Now, hold on for a second. Body is a singular Greek word, and that's super important. It's not do y'all not know that y'all's bodies... Do y'all not know that y'all's body... Let's continue is a temple singular to the Holy Spirit singular within y'all plural, whom y'all have from God. Y'all are not y'all's own, for y'all were bought with a price, so glorify God in y'all's body. Wow. This has more to do with health and appearance than it seemed like on first glance. This is about community. This is about unity. And this is the theological reality that determines everything that we do. Should we not be able to meet in this building is more or less irrelevant to our worship because we worship a God who has made us all his temple. And so whether here or in your living room, or 7-Eleven, or quarantine in a hospital, or trying to get back from Europe, or wherever you find yourself to be. God is in you, God is with you, and God is expressing His glory through you. Which means, to get back to our introduction, that our worship is not dependent on our circumstances. It's dependent on one, recognizing who God is. This God who gave Jesus Christ on our behalf to be brutally slaughtered on that cross, to give us purpose and hope that we don't deserve by taking a punishment that he didn't deserve. And calling us to a purpose that is greater than this life, that reverberates through history, and that does not stop when we've got an end date on our tombstone. This God calls us to life, even in the midst of our hard circumstances. Secondly, our worship determines, is determinant on us recognizing who we are. We are God's people. 
We are the means by which God declares his glory to the world. And I don't know if you guys have even noticed it. I hope probably that you have. But people out there need some hope. And people need some grace. And people need to know that there's a God who cares for them. And if we just kind of look through the course of Christian history, sometimes it is in these hardest times that the gospel shines the brightest. I'm reminded of the story of Patrick of Ireland. On Tuesday, Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day, which is full of a variety of really strange ritual, right? Wear green or I will pinch you. Who decided that? That's crazy, (laughs) right? And with our social distancing, this is going to become a serious problem, right? Go have a green beverage. Put a four-leaf clover pin on. I mean, you guys know, leprechauns and gold and rainbows and all kinds of weird stuff, right? Guys, I love to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, but not for that reason. I love St. Patrick's Day because of the historical figure to whom the holiday points. We're in the year 2020. In the year 390 AD, Patrick was born in Britannia, not in Ireland. First and foremost, St. Patrick, not even Irish. When he was 16 years old, there was a particularly cold winter that caused a river near his homestead to freeze, allowing an army of raiders to sack his entire community and take him into slavery. He was forcibly dragged 200 miles into Ireland, where for the next six years, he lived as a slave. While he was in slavery, he trusted Jesus. He was a punk skeptic in his early life. His father and grandfather were both Christians, but he rebelled. How interesting that in the midst of his turmoil and pain and enslavement, He embraces Jesus Christ and cultivates a faith that lives. One night, he has a dream, and it says, run, so he does, and he actually makes it home. So put yourself in his shoes. You're in your early 20s. You've spent the last half decade of your life in slavery. You're now at home. What do you do? Patrick goes and he gets a theological education. And then approximately six to ten years later, he puts together a team of missionaries and takes them back to Ireland. Patrick goes back to the very tribe that enslaved him and preaches the gospel. That is a decision that is only born out of a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Historically, Patrick favored the color orange rather than green. Historically, Patrick could care less about four-leaf clovers. He preferred the shamrock, a three-leaf clover, because he used it to teach the Trinity. One leaf, three leaves, however you would say that. You know what I mean. (laughs) Describing our God who shows himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why is Patrick's life relevant to ours? Because Patrick lived in hard and crazy times. His life was upended, maybe like our lives feel upended. His future was uncertain, maybe like it feels like our future was uncertain. But recognizing that he was not only created in God's image, but called to a purpose, and the vessel by which in community God makes him his glory known to the world, he goes into that hard situation and shares the gospel. And during his life, and his, after he died, his direct followers' lives, nearly the entire Irish region embraced Jesus Christ. Hundreds of churches planted. A church that persists today because of a nobody from Britannia who went through a hard situation but decided that that hard situation was not going to determine his worship because he had a God who saves and he was saved. And he went into that field with the message of salvation. 
However these next couple weeks are going to look, we're going to have to figure it out together, folks. I mean, we don't know. We may be getting calls and emails on Saturday night saying, hey, we're not going to be here next Sunday. We're just going to have to roll with it. But you know what? It's okay. Because we've got a Savior who is currently reigning from his throne, who has called us to a purpose. And whether standing next to someone trying to keep this six-foot distance or hanging out with their families or maybe shoot, I mean, let's just not mince any words. What if we catch the virus and then we're holed up for a couple weeks? Regardless of our circumstances, we've got a responsibility to worship. Because this building is not where God is, unless we are here. Wherever you are, God is with you. As we resolve today and as we go from this place, let's remember that. This place is just a place. When you walk out of that parking lot, you are not leaving the holy zone. (laughs) You are taking the holy zone with you. And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, use this time and use these tumultuous seasons to be a light to the gospel, to people who need hope. As we conclude here, we're going to have a short time of invitation. If you want to come up and practice some social distancing with me, I'll still pray with you. (laughs) But we're in this together. As we finish, as we pray, and as we sing, if you've got a decision to make, I invite you to make it. Maybe you've been so freaked out about this, you just need to say, God, I don't know what tomorrow brings, but I'm going to trust you regardless. Or maybe you're thinking, I have not put my trust in this God who gives me hope and purpose even in the midst of these hard things. I want to tell you about how you can trust that God and it'll change your life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your merciful provision. In this moment, we recognize that we are not in control. Goodness gracious, we are not in control. We don't even know what's going to happen later today. And yet, you do. And so we trust you. Lord, help us to have the kind of wherewithal to follow you even on the darkest days. And in the midst of this, to be Be that y'all who is the temple and to reflect this glory so that others can't mistake it. Lord, help us to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand with me?